Grace and peace be with you. I welcome you to this worship service with the First United Methodist Church of Oakhurst, New Jersey, on this, the second Sunday of Lent. If you have a candle available, I invite you to light it at this time, that together we might celebrate the fact that the light of Christ is in our midst. Will you join with me in the call to worship? God summons us to this place where we can learn how to serve our God without reservation or hesitation. God will send us from this place to tell others of God's hopes and dreams so they too can choose to follow God. Let us take this time in prayer. God of the word, breathe. Remind us to breathe as we move from one week to the next. Some days are holy and some just feel wholly exhausting. God of breathe. Remind us to breathe as we listen to news that is often not good. Call us to hear with hearts determined to beat to the call of love even when broken. God of breathe, remind us to breathe deeply, expanding and creating space in our very beings, making room for new energy, renewed conviction and renewing hope as we fully live into and give of ourselves on this day. We thank you for the power of your presence in our midst to inspire and to bring about renewal of life. Even in the driest, most empty seasons of our lives, you are there, offering new life, even in the sad, hidden corners of our days. In those times that seem so hopeless, your grace infuses us with life-giving hope. Lord God, help us to be set free from all that binds us and keeps us from living the abundant life that you offer us. Help us also to unbind and set free those around us who need our help and support to find their true freedom. May those who are bound by fear or grief or desperation or loneliness be set free by a comforting word from one of your children. May those who are bound by hunger, homelessness, political oppression, bias or addiction be set free by the work of justice seeking by your church in the world lord god we pray that all who are bound by the emptiness within their own souls might set their spirits free and celebrate your presence guide us as a community of faith in all that we do and all that we are so that with profound gratitude we might take each breath and with radical trust, we would exhale slowly and fully to gather our strength to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
together. God, we praise you for your faithful love and for the mercy you have shown toward us. Open our eyes to recognize your presence in our lives. Give us grace to hear your call and courage to follow without hesitation, knowing that your way is the way that leads to life. Amen. The Gospel lesson today is taken from John chapter 5, verses 1 through 9. After this, there was a festival of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now in Jerusalem, by the Sheep Gate, there is a pool, called in Hebrew, Beth Zatha, which has five porticos. In these lay many invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been ill for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I am making my way, someone else steps down ahead of me. Jesus said to him, Stand up, take up your mat, and walk. At once the man was made well, and he took up his mat and began to walk. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. seems like the normal response to that question. Well, I am told that in some regions there is considered a fifth season, mud season. According to the Farmer's Almanac, mud season is, given, is the name given to the period between winter's end, late March, and the beginning of spring, around May, when unpaved roads, dirt paths, and hiking trails become a muddy mess from the melting snow and spring rains. Mud season is a time of particular mess as boots and tires and pets all become an unwieldy muddle. In one pastor's words, the beautiful snow disappears, burned down to icy, grimy crusts, 
Yards expose a season's filth, matted and ugly. The ground is wet, sloppy and spongy. Brown mud covers everything. Green and flowering growth will come, but the mud comes first. He then goes on to see this image through the lens of our desire for new life, saying, there is also a season between repentance and rebirth between the old life and the new there is a kind of mud season in which we have become newly honest about our faults our wounds and our struggles we are exposed and vulnerable and not yet comfortable with a new way of living it's hard to change our lives it's a long process and it doesn't come all at once so we need to be humble and patient with the mess and gentle with ourselves. And we ought to be tender with others too, in case they also have entered their own mud season. New life will surely come, but only if we respect it. Be gentle with yourself and others and be patient with the mud seasons. The little green shoots will appear soon enough." End quote. The process of new life can be messy. It requires a level of honesty that can be difficult, like slogging through mud. And so it is for our man in today's gospel reading. The scripture reading for today depicts a man sitting at the edge of a pool, and the pool is positioned well below street level to, to catch the rain and supplement the underground waters. The water of that pool periodically stirred and it was believed that the first person to get in the water as it stirred would be healed of whatever their ailment might be. It may have been a legend, it might have been an old tradition, maybe just, just a rumor, but the promise of healing when the waters stirred was enough to bring the crowds. So there's a man there, and he's ill. The scripture doesn't spell out precisely what his illness is, but we may presume that he cannot walk. And what we do know is that for 38 years, he's been sitting there hoping to get in the water at that pr precious life altering moment. Now research suggests that the life expectancy for a man in ancient Palestine would have been anywhere from 30 years to maybe 40, 45 years. And so, in essence, this man has been sitting at the side of the pool the bulk of his life. This may be the only life he knows. Think about that just for a moment. He's been sitting there for the bulk of his life. And Jesus comes along and asks a simple yet pivotal question. And it's that question that I'd like us to focus on this morning. Jesus asks the man, do you want to be made well? It's a loaded question. And when you read the whole story, we realize this is not a, a precondition for Jesus to offer healing. And so we need not take this as some twisted suggestion that if we just want healing badly enough, we get it. Healing, like change, is never just purely an act of will. Jesus is not, 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 Jesus is not blaming the victim here. He's not suggesting that if the man just tried harder, he'd be well. That's our baggage. That's not Jesus' baggage. Rather, this comes as one of the many questions that Jesus asks across his ministry that confuse us and startle us and make us somewhat uncomfortable. Like when he asks the disciples, why are you afraid? Or how long shall I put up with you? Questions that, like new life, are a bit muddy. And as we saw in Jesus' discussion last week with Nicodemus, so again, this question today is less for the head and more for the heart, less about the brain and more about the spirit, aiming us to move back into that arena of mystery, which is new life. I would hope we could hear Jesus' question as a question for our deepest reflection. Do we really want a life that is new? This Lent, we are looking at the various 
barriers, the, the different struggles that we human beings may have in welcoming the new life that Jesus offers. Last week we looked at Nicodemus trying to make new life a thing that could be intellectualized and he struggled with the mystery that is new life. And today we see Jesus confronting us on a different level as he asks, do we really want to live fully or are we content with things as they are? Honesty about that question is vital as we make our way through the Lenten season of self-examination. If at the core we are content with how our lives are playing out, well then so be it. So, so Jesus asks this question, do you want to be made well? And I find the man's answer to Jesus to be rather curious. Now, certainly the fact that he is there implies that he does want healing, but what he actually offers to Jesus in response is a litany about how other people are at fault. No one will help me. They keep getting in my way. And we know how that is, right? Most of us can articulate with some clarity the ways in which other people have made life hard for us or are getting in the way of how we know our lives should be. If somebody else would just change, then our lives could be what they should be. Most of us can spell out rather clearly what other people should do differently, but Jesus doesn't ask the man at the pool about other people. Jesus asks the man at the pool, do you want this? And that points us to reflect on how often we say we want things to be different. We say we want a life to be full and meaningful, but we may stay conveniently out of touch with those ways in which we ourselves can be part of that process. Jesus is challenging the man and us to stake a claim in newness of life. Reverend Holmes says in part, and I quote, do you want to be made well? Sometimes not. We want to hang on to our hurt. We are accustomed to adapting. Sanity seems odd. Sobriety scares us. Wholeness intimidates us. It's uncertain beyond the prison gates. There's shelter in anger, in victimhood, in helplessness. How can we live without the pity? What would life be like without the drama? Do you want to be forgiven? Sometimes not. There's stability in despair. You can get comfy in the doghouse. Sometimes the greatest courage is needed not to fight monsters, but to live an ordinary life. Do you want to be made well? It will be work. It will bring on the unknown. You will stand on new legs. It will hurt. Take up your mat and walk. He will find you." End quote. Now, as pointed as Jesus' question is for us as individuals, I find that it speaks to me even more directly on a different level. As a citizen of a nation in deep turmoil, I, ask, I hear Jesus asking, do you want to be made well? Do we, do you, do I, do we want a country that is truly a peaceful and just place for all? Do we want the strife to cease? Do we want to move beyond our anger, beyond our rhetoric, beyond our, our collective disdain and shared self-righteousness? I can hear us answering, as, answering Jesus in the same way that the man of the pool did. You know, Lord, but they, you know, they're the ones that are making it so difficult. If they would just do such and such. In our national discord, we've become accustomed to sitting at the side of the pool, pointing out the shortcomings of others, so articulate with the ways that other people are the problem. As Jesus asks, do you want to be made well? Now it would be quite likely that after 38 years of sitting there by the side of the pool, maybe the man has just given up any hope of healing. And maybe that's us as well. Maybe we've given up hope of wholeness. Maybe we've forgotten what it's like to dream of a society in which the needs of others are honored tenderly and the well-being of one enriches the well-being of all. Maybe we've forgotten what it feels like to hope 
for a life in which we are set free from the grip of anger and fear, free of the ways that our brokenness is serving like a prison. Jesus asks us this startling question, confronting us with, do you want to be made well? And his question reminds us that this gift of wholeness is something Jesus deeply wants for us. Jesus wants us to thrive. Jesus wants us to be at peace. Jesus wants to deliver us from whatever baggage is paralyzing us. He wants us to know joy. He wants us to experience fullness of life as individuals and as a world. At a minimum, do you want to be made well urges us to turn our eyes and our hearts away from the countless obstacles before us, real as they may be, and turn toward the gift of new life that Jesus is offering. He is challenging us to take a long, hard look at the depth of our own desire for new life. It's a messy question. It's a messy proposition this offer of new life. New life begins with mud season. Green growth will come, but the mud comes first. Let us pray. Do we want to be made well? Yes, Lord. Yes, we do. We want to be made well. Amen. Will you receive the benediction? Go now into the world, taking God's hands as you begin anew. Amen. <laughs>